kind of like the same thing when people say, oh, I open my uh, basement door in the summer to get all that moist air out of there. <laughs> you know, you're, you're yeah. doing the same thing. You're, you're basically... Did I tell you guys about the time I tried to dry my basement floor by running a fan on it and directing upstairs air to it, thinking it was warmer? Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Editorial Director Justin Fink. Hey, guys. Digital Brand Manager Rob Wadsack. Hello. And Producer Jeff Rose. Hello. Hi, Jeff. Hi. 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 <laughs> okay. Please email us your questions at fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. I just felt like nobody says hi to Jeff. I, I know. I, you, hi you, I, I thought it was actually nice that we try to pull our producer into the show, but it just threw us all off. Everybody froze. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna adjust myself here, my, my, my volume. Excuse me, audience. Okay. I'm just adjusting things. <laughs> it's very technical over here. We do. We have, we have four uh, knobs. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Three microphones, four knobs, and none of them do anything. <laughs> yes. I don't think they did anything. Let's keep moving. All right. So, so a couple of weeks ago, when people are hearing this, a couple of weeks ago we had a, that Keep Craft Alive event at the International Builders Show, and um, the one one of the things I noticed, and we've been talking about lately about that, is that how much more tradespeople share information with other tradespeople than they probably did a generation ago, mostly because they have access to these people that they never had access to before that are doing the same kinds of stuff. The culture has kind of shifted too. It's it it used to be kind of protect at all costs the knowledge you have about your craft, even to the point where sometimes apprentices were like denied kicked out of the room yeah, until the... they were at the right level. That and we still get that in the magazine sometimes. You know, you talk to an author and say, Hey, I'd, I'd, I'd like I, to do an article about And they say, I don't want to give away all yeah, my secrets. Exactly. And it's and you know, I respect that. It's like, okay, well then you're you're not our guy. But for the most part it seems like that's changed. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's changed because you need as many people as possible to know as much as they can. It is so complicated. <laughs> well, and also it's like there there might have been a time when it was easy to protect y information and ideas, but with the internet, it's like there's no way. I mean, you, even if you even if you don't share your version of that idea, there's somebody else out there who is. So it's 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 you might as well just be part of the community rather than trying to hide from it. Yes. I've always thought that people who are forthcoming and willing to share what they know are far more successful than those who try yes. and keep it in a box. Yes. I, I don't yeah. know. It's a, they're not going to replace you just because you're showing them how to do it. It's no, not... you're an expert. Yes. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like the same idea how people hold on to their nest egg of their savings and think, you know, that's what's going to give them security in life when what? most of the most successful people in the world, you know, billionaires, uh, entrepreneurs, are people who have lost everything and regained it because it's all about their attitude and their skills, not right. about holding on to one little thing. I'm reassured that my uh, lifelong squandering of money will uh, eventually pay dividends, Rob, right? Is right. that of what course. you're saying? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel much better about things. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have retirement. You know, it's going to be yeah. fine. It'll be fine. I'm going to be rich later. That's what Rob You're says. You're just never going to stop working. That's my plan. Yeah. yeah. And well, that's okay. That's just like with houses. It's like, you know, so much of what we teach people, especially when you're talking about energy efficiency, is all about return on investment. And you're like, oh, is it worth it to spend the money to, you know, $50,000 to do a deep energy retrofit, a full insulation retrofit of an old house that is so much more difficult to do than with a, with a brand new house that you're building from scratch? And it's like nobody ever really brings, well, do you want to be comfortable for the next 15 years that you're living in that right. house? It's like, yeah, well, maybe that's just part of the cost of being comfortable. It's all like this return on investment game. Like, well, you're never going to get that money back if you redo your kitchen. You're like, well, what if my kitchen just sucks and yes, I want I a new a kitchen? One? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't like, think you, know, you know what else I don't get any money back on? When I live in an apartment and I finish and, I, and I move out yeah. and yeah. I've, I've paid to live there every month. I think that payback is a very poor reason to do almost yeah. anything. Yes. Life is uh, about enjoying it. And yeah. if you're not happy in your space, change it. 
Yeah, I mean, if you if you're afraid to take on a a new awesome hobby, my dad is kind of like this. He's very he grew up very very uh, you know tight cash, and so he's got a very strong uh, his governor for spending is <laughs> is very restrictive, um, and he has a hard time getting himself into new hobbies because he's he can't justify the can't balance the pleasure with the spending. I have no trouble starting a new I don't either. New hobby. No. I That's- don't either. As the ones I seek out, seemingly. Yeah, well, yeah, because half the fun is gearing up for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like... like Wait, uh, I get my dragster. That'll I, really suck up some cash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, you know, I took the day off the other day, and I was working. I planned on doing some creative projects in my workshop, but then I realized that my uh, registration on my car was like a month and a half expired. This so is your daily driver? Yeah, so I was like, okay, I better finish that exhaust leak, fix that exhaust leak that was... Um, um, Causing me to not get my emissions test, which is why I had let my registration last. But so you, you put fail some tape a... on it? Well, no, I actually spent the whole day dismantling this thing in my driveway, welding it back together, getting the parts to fix it. But it was an excuse to buy some new tools that I wanted to use in my workshop. What did you and, get? Uh, I actually got this little tiny Dremel tool that's like a pen-sized Dremel tool. It's like an 18-volt plug-in Dremel tool that... I've wanted to get as a like a carving and engraving tool for a long time, and <laughs> he wanted and to monogram the he, exhaust no, pipe before he no, put you it know, on there. No, you know what I needed it for is I had to I had to drill out some bolts that were completely rotted away, and there was no way I could get even the tiniest drill bit to seat on the center of one of those bolts without grinding a little dimple in it first. And I was like, well, I can use this tool for for carving in the wood shop afterwards. What is it? Had you tried it? a center punch? No, this was more. This was better. <laughs> I never even heard of such a thing. What well, it? it's just a little Dremel tool, it's but an I, used a, tool, I like... just used a carbide grinding bit in it. So I uh, think it's called a burr. A burr, exactly. Yes, but anyway. Anyway, we're kind of go off on our tangents. Here. I want. I got to get into welding. This whole thing is a tangent. I'm sick of answering <laughs> insulation questions. If you people don't know how to insulate yeah, your I, houses by now, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of agree. So there, one yeah. of our. Uh, Question askers this time described it as the fine insulating podcast. Yeah, it used to be fine roof venting. So <laughs> we're, we're, but just to yeah. encourage people, we do answer other types of questions. Don't I'd like even, a design yeah. question once in a while. And we love sawdusty stuff. That's what we're, you know, Rob will answer all your metalworking questions, I'm sure. Yeah. Have we had any metalworking questions? Um, Rob, what will it take the, for me to build a backyard forge? And I'm not saying, like this, I want it to overlap with home building, like okay. like a minor amount of including some steel in some projects. Okay. So is, so, is this too far afield to talk about, Patrick? It's hex. No, it's I've, 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 I've wondered this myself. So yeah, I I've been blacksmithing on and off for like twenty years now, and so basically at the dawn of the internet is when I was first starting to learn, and it was hard because there wasn't much information on it, and then eventually found some online guilds and and got into a knife making guild and. I originally started with charcoal and coal, which is what traditionally blacksmithing was done with. And you can build a forge, meaning the actual device, out of an old truck brake drum or a garbage can <laughs> lid. Or yeah, it, you just need something you know, to contain the You basically need c- coal. air to, to move in, to, just like a furnace or a pellet stove or whatever, you need it, you need air to blow to you know to force the fire and commonly it's in the bottom of this vessel that you've made right you make a hole in it and you connect a, a blower does this and, yeah. does this look similar to the old kind of can assemblies you would use to heat up soldering irons when they were handheld soldering irons it's like almost like a, a can shape with air entry at the bottom and a little slot at the top of it you can kind of rest the irons in there you ever I seen mean, those it's basically or? it's basically the same i same idea you need a fuel source and in order to get the temperature high enough you need air to right. move in and like so I didn't have a whole lot of luck with charcoal because it's kind of like trying to learn how to drive stick shift. You got to learn how to drive the car and shift the transmission at the same time. You got to manage a fire with mm-hmm. a coal fire. But so I've m- done most of my blacksmithing with a propane forge, which you can pick up for like thousand bucks. I think, I think the one I I have now costs about five or six hundred dollars. When I got it, it was like a three or four hundred dollar. All right, so I'm not forge. doing that. What are my What are my <clears> other <throat> options? Get the brake drum, can, or and, you and can use charcoal, soft coal, soft coal. What the heck is that? It's it's coal. It's, it's for foraging. And you can yeah, buy it online. You can buy it online. Oh. Or if there's an old, like, antique railroad in your area that there runs those old steam engines, they sometimes sell it to blacksmiths. Or it the... falls off the coal car. Yeah. So it's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My grandmother tells stories of picking up coal by the train tracks in the Great Depression. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. with a little radio flyer or a wagon. She what a call it. great effort for the family, I got to yeah. say. You get like one lump of coal per day or something. 
God. You stay <laughs> stay warm. It's like it's like having firewood in your house. Like you stay warmer chopping and processing the firewood than actually burning it. Especially yeah. if you can get the kids out of the house. And yeah, <laughs> to work. <laughs> But but as far as but as far as the forge goes, I mean, you can make a forge for next to nothing if you're good at scrounging materials, and there's plenty of sources online for plans. So uh, I mean, the the three or four hundred dollar gas forge you could make out of like an old, you know, water tank or really any vessel I, that you. There's something with. way cooler about <clears throat> coal forging versus gas forging. I would oh, say for it's sure. just, it's yeah. just yeah. cool. Got to wear your yeah a leather yes. apron exactly. You should yeah. probably suspenders. You have enough facial hair. I'd have to grow You'd a beard. You'd have to start growing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is there yeah. a risk of catching your beard on fire when oh, you're sure, using a yeah. forge? Of course. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's half the battle. I got the forge set up. Yep. And, and, but I got to get an anvil now, right? Anvils are super yeah. expensive. Yeah. I mean. But you can use other stuff as an anvil. <clears throat> like, like what? Like a, a length of, people, of uh, railroad, railroad track, track is what people or, often use. Really? Yeah. yeah. In fact, there's like, you can see, you can go online, go on. Pinterest or whatever, and find tons of pictures of little chunks of railroad track that have been converted into anvils, or just use it as is. I mean, the only reason you need to convert it or modify it is if you want the horn, horn in the front. The pointy for part. Doing... You couldn't do it with like an I beam <laughs> section, though, right? It's just too. It's you too need lightweight. Mass. Yeah. You need mass. So basically, the people think of a blacksmith as swinging a hammer with their might, with their muscles, but really, it's the mass that's doing it. Like, if, you're, if your arm is getting tired from blacksmithing, it means you're working too hard. You're supposed to let the... Yeah. Ah, oh, come on. Swinging a hammer for hours on end is, is no, tiring. but you're not... But the thing is, if you were ex- getting tired quickly, that means that you're putting force into it where really you're supposed to just be lifting the hammer and it's recoiling off the anvil. And the ma- the more massive the anvil, the more it's going to recoil off of so it. So that's what's going on? So yeah. you don't you want it to be bouncy almost? Yeah. It's still hard. Okay, come on over to my shop and I'll show you. <laughs> I did some forging in uh, high school shop class. We had a gas forge. And we, near as I can tell, we never made anything except other tools for like forging. forging? Yeah. yeah. Like tongs yeah. and... Yes, yeah, I've, I've done a Made bunch a of I've done a bunch of wrought iron railings for customers over the years. Some, some of the houses I've yeah, worked on. Yeah, that's the kind of like little hooks and like yeah. maybe a, a, a strap and what do they call it? A pintle hinge. The... Stra- yeah, strap hinges which are usually mounted on a pintle. Yeah, yep. mm-hmm. yeah, that kind of stuff just for screwing around. Yeah. You know. All right. Sure. Okay. I think you'd love it. Oh, I know I would. You know, the neighbors behind you are going to love that banging too. Yeah. yeah. I, I, was, <laughs> I was talking to my wife about. It's like this year. This might be the year we have to put up a privacy fence for, for the neighbors. And I, so I go online. I type in Google, I'm looking for inspiration, like budget privacy fences, some creative thing, you know, yeah. anything to avoid the the six by eight stockade picket fence at the big box store, you know. Yeah. And on the first page of Google image results was a uh, piece of plywood cut out in the shape of a middle finger extending up <laughs> that said. Um, I hope you enjoy this more than you enjoyed looking at my boat <laughs> that somebody had stuck in their yard. That is priceless. <clears throat> so I'm going to do that. Okay. So do you have multiples for the privacy? Or, yeah, you have to yeah. make a lot of middle finger boards. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, should we answer uh, Chris from Puget Sound here? I guess. Chris is guess, interrupting guess my he's, fun. Guess what he's asking about. Insulation. He is. Hi, guys. We have a 1920 Craftsman Bungalow on Vashon Island near Seattle in Puget Sound. The house is balloon frame construction and lacks insulation except for some poorly fit bats in the attic. The second floor has sloped ceilings with the drywall attached directly to the 2 by 4 rafters, down to knee walls with closets behind. I can get access to almost the entire underside of the roof, but I... I'll just, I can get access to the roof. Many of the exterior walls need to come down to fix, and I'm not opposed to taking the ones that don't need to be if I have to. As far as I can tell, there is nothing between the shiplap sheathing nailed to the exterior of the studs and the siding. Okay, so. That's a lot going on. He wants to know, is there a way to insulate an old house like this without residing it? Thank you guys so much for all the episodes. I've learned so much and really enjoy the conversational or you approach you take to building issues. And thanks in advance for any help. Uh, he goes on, should I worry about venting the attic? If I cut and cobble foam into the bays between the ceiling and the roof, do I need to leave an air gap? Would I be able to get enough R value out of the ceiling if I insulate the underside of the roof deck? Or do I have to blow all attic spaces above and behind the knee wall full of cellulose? Wow. Got, so it's two by four rafters? Is that what he said? Yeah, I think so. So have you seen this house? I think we have a photo <clears throat> of it. Is that a cute house or what? Yeah, it almost looks like something you'd see in one of those uh, Sears catalogs. It's you know? adorable, and I'm sure it's an 
impossibly difficult house to insulate. Look at how cut up the roof is. It's got that overhanging porch I, assembly. I love when, when you get to certain areas of the country where where the, the house number is five digits long. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I can't You're on imagine. an island. How could you have that many I was, houses? I was just going to say that. Like, how can they have that many houses um, on the island? Okay, so... So let's let's talk on. about insulating the walls first, and then we'll get to the attic. Yeah, because that's the easy part. So what did you do on your house? You blew in cellulose. I blew in cellulose, but that was it was a calculated decision. You know, it was. Did it you was, have a WRB? Do you know? I have building paper. So you had you know the rosin, the old rosin paper kind of stuff. This is what is was existing on Correct. your house. Yeah. So th- like I said, it was a weighed decision. It was do I take the siding off and add insulation there and put the siding back? Couldn't make the numbers work out. Um, do I take down all the plaster on the inside? Even it, if the numbers worked out, no. Because you can't live in the house like yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, so I, I decided to blow in cellulose, um, which— Drilled holes w- from the inside or the right, outside? from the inside, which So will... we should tell—what uh, was his name, Chris? Chris. We should tell Chris— uh, So the, the t- t- traditional approach, as you may or not know, may or may not know, is to drill holes in each of the stud bays and yep. under windows and fill them with high-density cellulose. You can do that from the outside, too, commonly if you have a clabbered house— you can take off one or two clapboards, and you can access all the stud bays that right, way. Right, right. There's a problem with that, though, right? There's a problem with accessing them from the outside or a problem with cellulose? There's a problem, potentially, if you don't have a WRB. Sure. If there's no, if you have a lot of moisture moving through the wall, now your insulation is going to get wet. And it's not going to work, and it's going to make a moldy, rotted mess. Well, yes. The insulation probably won't, won't get moldy, but the things that it's touching might. Yeah. Um, I'm counting on the fact that my house is leaky enough that it's probably fine driving a lot of heat out through the walls on a very consistent basis. Have you noticed uh, the house was more comfortable after you did this? Not really. <laughs> I mean, it's. I mean, I've got a huge single-pane windows, now getting backed up with storm windows, but it's, it's, it's an old house. Yeah. Yeah. A um, forced air system, which is just not comfortable. I would say... But he's talking about the walls are already open, right? In some cases, yes. Okay. So that those make sense to insulate, right? Yeah. Would I tear off the plaster and insulate the ones that aren't affected uh, in some way or need to be I mean, ripped it, down? It's no. not a huge house. It, 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 you know, it all depends on scale, time, you know, and maybe how goals. many friends you have. Like, could you yeah. buy a couple of cases of beer for a weekend to do some blowing out some plaster? But, of course, then you've got tons of stuff to pat, put back together when you're done. And you got to dispose of tons I mean, of plaster. I mean, <laughs> in my— And laugh. In my daughter's bedroom, because it's in this remote corner of the house, we, we have basically point source heat because I have a pellet stove and I've got mini splits. So, the I mean, that's wasn't that saying he doesn't have heat like everywhere in his house, right? He has so, got a wood stove. Yeah. So, um, mm. so when you have point source heat, then you then those peripheral areas you got to if you really want them to be comfortable, they have to be better insulated than than the middle. So, like my daughter's room, I did the cut and cobble foam. In there. In the and ceiling or in the walls? In the walls. The ceiling's an unfinished attic, so I'm going to blow cellulose in there eventually. But, the, but you know, I see that you pointed out in your notes um, Martin's article about uh, insulating walls. Let's, let's hold up on that for a okay. sec, because yeah. I'd say that's the definitive okay. solution. But, yeah, so I basically, I just, I felt comfortable enough that I was leaving enough of a gap between my clabbers. I have no sheathing in my house. So I tore off all the plaster on the inside and put foam in the walls. Packed what kind it of foam? Uh, it was EPS. So you don't want to use polyiso in that situation if you don't have a WRB because it'll suck up water. So you need to use EPS or XPS. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, as long as you're, if your flashing details are good and, you, and your siding's good, then you can be a little bit less careful. And have, why would polyiso <clears throat> suck up water? It's, it absorbs water. Its stru- cell structure allows it to right, which uh, is take the whole on thing water. about it not being used exterior, uh, especially below grade. I've seen uh, EPS suck up water too, though. I've, I've lifted panels that have been left outside, and they were it's, uh, they had the, taken the out lower a lot density of water. EPS is uh, will take on water more readily than the yeah. higher density stuff. There's no good answer for any of this stuff. It's like I would <laughs> say that the thing to do is worry less about the insulation and focus on your air barrier. There, this the style house has a number of uh, problems. One is the the porch have a, how the the roof uh, is the main roof, and there's never any sheathing above the porch ceiling, right? That's open framing, so that is uh, a very leaky spot. The dormers are a problem on this style house, so I would very much recommend uh, focusing on sealing up the air barrier before I worried about insulating. Yeah, but how? 
with uh, you do interior, Thermofly, yeah, uh, drywall. So you're talking um, about? I mean, like you were saying, th- th- this house has a a porch that's integrated into the roof, and what you're saying basically is that over that porch ceiling, there's usually air open gaps framing in the framing in this time period, and so. Maybe, in all time maybe periods. Could, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe you'd tear open the knee walls in that section of the house, go in there and seal and up close the, that off. And close that off. Yeah. And any holes that go into the <clears throat> attic as well. And as far as venting the attic, I wouldn't worry about it because this house is not going to work anyway. Yeah. And, and I know people have. Because <laughs> of, of the big dormer. The in big front of dormer. It. And. Yeah, there's really not much to do in that. And how's he going to get a soffit vent with that sloping fascia? Yeah, and, but, you know. the, but I mean, an air barrier is not the same as a vapor barrier in the sense that. A vapor barrier, you can it can be discontinuous and it still does a pretty good job. An air barrier, I mean, if you put a lot of effort into these little spots, but you're not touching the rest of the spots, it's you got to do them all. So, but but what about the other spots? I mean, it, he's ha- so you're saying that he has to take all the plaster down? No, I'm saying he should get what he can with the access <clears throat> he has to close up to seal to create an air barrier. But you wouldn't touch the ones that are already plastered. What would I you wouldn't do there? because I think the plaster is probably a good air barrier. I mean, this is a good candidate maybe for what we've been talking about in the past with uh, blower door directed air, air sealing. sealing. Yeah. Because you can't yes. really know where all those air leaks are. You can you can guess. And the but shape of this house know. is about as hard as it gets to fix. Yeah. And, and you know, you go into the basement. I have a friend who has a house about this era, the early 20th century. You go in the basement, and sometimes the wall cavities are open right to right. the basement. Yeah, totally. That's what your biggest concern is going to be, Chris. That I, I mean, maybe you already know, but you did, you mentioned here the balloon framing. And for people who don't know, that means that your studs run all the way from the foundation to the roof with usually no, no, sometimes fire blocking that somebody may have added, but usually not. So like if you wanted to, if so for instance, if you took a marble in your attic and you dropped it down the wall, it would come out in the basement. Come out in the basement. And yeah. that, talk about the, the most efficient way to lose yeah. heat is that. Yeah. For a friend of mine has had previous homeowner had attempted to blow cellulose into his balloon framed walls and it was fill all the basement f- it, we didn't fill the basement but it's, all, it's Where's certainly it going it's certainly falling out into the basement and he didn't uh, seal it first at the basement well it wasn't my friend it was it was the way he bought the house and oh. and i don't know if someone jammed some foam in there and it fell out or or what but it, i that was one of the first things i noticed when i was trying to help him out with that place i would say if money was no object rip down all the plaster and then uh th- Rob alluded to an article that we're going to put on the podcast uh, webpage, uh, a green building advisor piece done by Martin Holiday on insulating walls in an old house without sheathing. And he describes uh, either putting a, a house wrap or felt paper on the inside of the stud base with little tabs to staple to the sides of the studs and then blowing uh, closed cell foam on top of that, which seems like the best way to go, but that's going to be very expensive. And that was one of, I think, two pretty good options that he outlined in that. The other one was to do something similar that I think Mike Gurton did for a, uh, a an attic venting article yep. where you build rigid foam with little blocking on it, and you can actually do it by slicing the rigid foam at the edges and folding it over to create the blocking out of the foam. But the idea is that you want an air gap between... He did, this house has painted wood siding on it, right. and when you start putting insulation up against the siding, like that, a lot of times, especially in a wet place like the Northwest, uh, you'll start noticing that your paint just doesn't last as long. I had a neighbor in Stowe who's uh, had to paint the north side of his house every two years <laughs> after they blew in insulation because just the paint blew off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, that's the thing is like, especially in older homes, it gets so much more complicated because one thing well, it, you'll solve one problem yep. and cause two other problems. Right. and That's uh, kind of why I'm hesitant to do uh, m- much in the way of insulating of this house. Yeah, and, and, and in reality, it, it, a lot of old houses, you're losing way more heat from air leakage than you are from radiation through, you know, radiant, you know, conduction through the walls. So, I mean, so how are you suggesting they touch up that plaster wall in order to make, I mean, because you're, what you're generally suggesting in the finished parts of the house is using the plaster as the air barrier. Right. Yes. So... Take off the baseboard and caulk along the floor. What are you doing around outlets? Um, I'd get a blower door test and do what the yeah, biggest holes. That. Yeah, I, I did in my house, and then and when I had an energy audit later on, the guys used the same method where they just used a clear paintable caulk at the baseboards so that you're not even popping anything off. You're just, just going right underneath it. there with a with a damp rag afterwards to get it to get it you know so it's not all globbed up. Does on it your look floor. okay? Yeah, I mean, I mean. 
certainly in some places where if you have big gaps under your baseboard, you're going to see it, but it's, I think it's an acceptable alternative to the amount of work it would take to, to do it behind yeah. finished materials. I need to do that at my house, the blower door directed air sealing. And this is a good time of year for it, too, because it's, it's cold, but it's, it's not brutal. Like, yeah. you could... You can get a, a pretty good difference in temperature that you can get a reading with a temp gun without, you know, having to then start your whole house over again at, at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Do you guys have yeah. any idea what this service costs? Is it like thousands or hundreds? Oh, to have somebody come out? Yeah, and tell you where to seal. It depends on where you are because in Connecticut, we it's subsidized, It's a state sub- subsidized program. You pay 200 bucks flat fee, and they get paid on top of that based on how much they improve the air tightness of your home. So, so they do... Pre and post test lower yes. doors. They do pre and post tests, and they their payment from the state is based on the difference between their pre and post. Tests. And this is funded by like a surcharge on electric bills, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was just gonna borrow yours. You're welcome to. <laughs> yeah, we should just start renting it out. Actually, there are places I think you can rent them. I think online re- even. I uh, uh, I hope that if I hope that's true. I've had little little success finding a place to rent them. Really? But, yeah. Maybe. But I'm that was that years up. ago. So, you know, this is part of the building code now. So I, I would imagine, like, why doesn't Home Depot have a blower door to rent? Damn it. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes. It Don't go- they sponsor us sometimes? Don't we have some pool with those people? <laughs> I've seen people build their own blower doors, too. I mean, certainly. Yeah, but what Mike do you do Gurdon about the manometer? Um, well, you don't have it's, a monometer. It's just if for, I mean, for the, this, you're not, you don't really yeah. need one. Yeah. You're just trying to see where it's leaking. You know, a smoke pencil or a, or a Marlboro. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I borrowed one of tell the, my wife I need to start smoking again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I borrowed one of the blower doors that we had here at the, at the office uh, a couple, a bunch of years ago. And, um, behind my, my house is balloon frame. So you can feel the air moving through the floors in the winter and, um, I put the blower door in the house, and I had I hadn't built doors for this one closet yet, and it had some like missing parts in the wall, and this curtain was hanging on that closet door. It was like forty five degrees to the ground from all the air rushing in. Oh, through, at least you knew through, where to like, see all the gaps in yeah. that in that room. It's like it's unbelievable sometimes to to realize how much air is moving through your house when it's the temperature difference between the inside and the outside is is pretty high. I'm really curious to. If after I get all the storm windows finished and hung, I mean, like I'm in the, they're all, they're going up now. I got to get more weather stripping, but to, you know, to do a test and then hang them all and do a test and just see with the manometer if that even made a difference. I you wouldn't know? recommend it. I know, it just makes yeah. you depressing. Sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too depressing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I imagine also your your um, storm windows are going to be as much about the radiant. Yeah, it's going to make you more comfortable. Of being sure. near the windows than anything else. Yeah, the kind of the craftsman style house I'm in, there's, you know, four by four windows in a lot of cases. They're just massive. Yeah. That's and the couch cool. is right next to it. Yeah. That's cool, though, right? I mean, it, it's awesome. For most of the year, it's, it's a great thing. I, I mean, it would be an absolute shame to replace them. And I would never get the money back anyway. So this is almost like a, a reasonable stopgap. Yeah. A reasonable assist yeah. to, to the heat loss. We'll, but, have to, we'll have to do a blower door but, test, though, because I'm curious. But this guy mentioned in his question um, interior storms, which makes are a lot awesome. of sense. Yeah. They're awesome. Yeah. They make so much sense. They make way more sense than exteriors, but and they're, they're expensive. Yeah, because yeah, you, you're not worried about Way like, less causing... than new windows, though. Yes. Way less than new windows. Yeah, it, and, and, and when you think about the fact that there's no disturbance to the actual fabric of the house right. to install them. Maybe drill a couple of holes. If the, Some of them you have little pins yep. that pop into the inside of your, your uh, window frame yep. and uh there's a company in connecticut that does that and i will put that on the podcast notes for- yeah i mean it's for people who don't understand the science of it just real briefly if you have the window if you have the storm window on the interior that means your airtight plane is inside the window so you're not going to have any condensation problems on the window if you have the airtight portion outside of your leaky window now you still have air leaking Cold. through your old yeah. window and condensing on that airtight storm window so it that's why they have little vents in them oftentimes that you can yep. open, which is like, so why do I have the window then? <laughs> yeah, I've always wondered. Yeah, and, you, and the, old school, <laughs> the old school exterior storm windows would always have the problem of trapping water and rotting out your sills. Right. Well, they had weep holes, too. Yeah, those yeah. were great. Right. I'm looking forward to rotting my windows. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Nice. 
Well, you know, one before we get off this guy's topic, I, I had asked a similar question on the forum one time on GBA and Green Building Advisor and Martin About Holler. your house? Yeah, because I, I have, you know, okay. so many things that I've done in my house have come up in these sure. questions. And um, Martin Holiday said, uh, you know, there's always simpler solutions, and sometimes you can just uh, justify the idea of doing less and having more time to go camping and fishing and uh, yeah. Spend less time your... in the house. You won't be as uncomfortable. Yeah. Hey. Just real quickly before we move off this, could you drill holes in storm windows and then put a very vapor open air sealing tape across the hole? Do you think it would work? Do you think you'd get enough with the to, tape off to reduce enough the moisture to keep that's from, inside there? To keep it from, from condensing in there? You're talking about a diffusion vent in your storm windows? Exactly. Oh but my air goodness. seal. This is it's this. not it's not high tech. You drill a hole and you put a piece of tape over the inside. Yeah, I guess it. This it, is NASA, NASA you know, stuff, man. But I guess you're also going to have to start thinking about the amount of surface area versus volume. Like, are, are a couple of little holes going to make that much difference, or would you be better off using some sort of vapor uh, permeable um, glass? Foam, no foam, a foam gasket. How about screening? A, a screen? You could use screen. Yeah, uh, gasket, a, you know, a vapor yeah. permeable foam gasket or something like. You know that, what it maybe. needs is smart arrows, and then it would know what yeah, to do. Yeah, if I yeah. just drew the arrows, I tell the, which way to. What just, color are you going to make them though? Well, they'd have. To, I'd have yeah. to chain them seasonally. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Airflow this way. Small little fan in there to vent it out. Sure. Uh, maybe maybe, maybe one of our positive pressure. Very smart mm -hmm. uh, listeners will have a, an answer to that. They I do better. not. It's worth trying. I think you should. I think you could do a side by side test. You're damn right, I could. Right? Living lab over there. Oh, man, this exactly. is good stuff. This is science. <laughs> or I could just ask Martin <laughs> if it would work. I think he's going to tell you to get a hobby. Have you, guys <laughs> ever, have you guys ever been on that, what is it, Build It Solar website? It's it's sort of like an old school website that's sort of a forum of articles of people who have done all kinds of crazy projects. That's the one where you can build your own blower door. <laughs> yeah, those those are the guys who you want to test out all of these things, you know. And so you know, so what test. color tape do you think is the right one? I, I think it's, um, I'm not sure anybody. Sega? Yeah, Sega probably, yeah. probably is the one that makes it, or uh, Tescon. Okay. Another brand. We'll have to consult with the uh, retailers of I, these products. I, I love the names of all those German tapes. It's like I use them like Sego Wiglove and yeah. like on like my plastic, sh you know, air barrier. <laughs> they really don't know anything about marketing <laughs> in the U.S., do they? <laughs> Wiglove. This uh, next question <clears throat> comes from Dan from West Haven, Connecticut. Hi, fellas, longtime listener and DIYer. My home was a complete gut job that I did mostly on my own. There's nothing like listening to FHB podcasts while doing home projects. Well, I couldn't agree more. Here's my latest issue. The finished portion of my basement floor is coated with speckled epoxy coating and covered by foam mats like a martial arts studio. Very soon after installing the mats, condensation began accumulating in spots under them. I bought dimpled underlayment thinking that the additional air circulation would prevent the condensation, but it hasn't. There is never bulk water, and due to the epoxy coating, I find it hard to believe that the moisture is working its way through the concrete and the coating. This basement used to be carpeted, and the carpet padding was glued directly to the concrete, and it was never moist. The room is primarily an exercise and laundry space, hence the matting. The walls are insulated with 1-inch XPS glued to the walls, then R15 Roxel. The room is conditioned with central heat and AC. I run a dehumidifier for a few hours per day, and it's unclear whether or not that is helping. I know this is a rather unconventional floor system, but do you have any ideas and or products to help prevent this? Should I be cleaning slash mopping up this condensation when it happens, or is it okay to let it sit and dry on its own? I hope I've provided enough info. Mm, this is a cool one. So my guess is that this is the same kind of problem that you have when you put foam sheathing in your walls and you don't air seal it well. You've got a cold surface on the uh, on the outside, on the damp side. Right. The slab and, is the cold surface. Yeah, and you're not and the fact that these tiles have gaps every couple of feet, you're allowing moist air to get in there and condense underneath the foam. Right. And especially now that the dimple mat is there, that, right? That it's makes, got even that more almost flow. makes it worse. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you so you, in an attempt to use the dimple mat to create enough airflow to pick up the moisture again, your, it, which is a, a valiant effort. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's really just allowing more air to get there to condense. It, it just nails home how um, how complicated and 
but at the same time, sort of simple. This some is of these pretty simple are. problem because it's like you're. It's kind of like the same thing of people say, "Oh, I open my uh, basement door in the summer to get all that moist air out of there." <laughs> you know, you're you're yeah. doing the same thing. You're you're basically. Did I tell you guys about the time I tried to dry my <laughs> basement floor by running a fan on it and directing upstairs air to it, thinking it was warmer? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what happened? It got wetter. I kept saying, why is this getting wetter? I've been drying this for hours. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So so I got to tell you, so many people think that open the door and, and let it or dry. Or open your let basement windows. And it's like, yeah. yeah. So, so when we, I bought my house, my the guy who sold it to me said, you know, I made these fixed panes of glass for the basement hopper windows. He's like, you're going to want to replace those, you know, because you're going to want to be able to open up the, the windows to let the space dry out. And I'm like... <laughs> No, I am not going to. I don't want to. I'm going to caulk do, them closed. I'm going to never touch those fixed you know windows. What, you know what is the scariest thing about this is is that our building codes have have it, yes. used to have it wrong. Yes. Like vented crawl spaces. Yep. It makes like, no sense. You have to put that vent in there, even though as soon as that inspector leaves, you're going to put a piece of rigid foam yep. in that hole. Yep. And that's the smart thing to do. Yeah. yeah. So so in this situation. Um, you know, you guys know that I used to work in uh, everything. The, yeah, well, everything. <laughs> we used to work where we were doing like retail in- environments where we were building like trade show booths and yeah, and, we're sick of hearing about it. But <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but we you're used, so impressive. We, no, but we used um, rollout rubber matting that's continuous. Yeah, and you can buy that. A lot of the gyms, instead of using these foam puzzle tiles, will you buy huge rolls of well, that? Well, that's stuff. a good idea. But and what then, do you do about the edges? Because it's you're gonna leak in there. So some. what I would probably use is is gaffer's tape. Tape actually. it down. That's I, where you put all your weights. Hold right. Down Hold the, the edges. edges. Yeah. That's right. But seriously, I, I was um, gonna say to uh, just run the dehumidifier more. He says he's running a few hours a day, which is just not enough. It's got to run all the time. Yeah. And there's an energy penalty associated with that. And you got to make sure your basement is separate from the rest of the living space. Otherwise, you're trying to dehumidify the whole house. And if you have windows open, you're trying to dehumidify the outdoors as well. So. You got to kind of create the basement its own little environment. Is yeah. Gaffer's tape air? That's got to be air permeable. We need our video expert. Okay, Jeff's in the room. Is Gaffer's, Gaffer's tape, tape is air pretty. Permeable? It's pretty open. I would think so. Yeah. If you um, haven't used Gaffer's tape, it is pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah. You got to get some the black Ga- tape. Yeah, Gaffer's tape is like you think duct tape is cool. Gaffer's yeah. tape is so much. Jeff, cooler. isn't there like what, what's the best like one, one, Jeff? We had a talk. Yeah. Well, well Permacell, but they're out of business. But oh, oh man. man, you old school video guys. So what's the one you've been <laughs> buying more lately? Recently, uh, Pro Gaff. Pro Gaff. There you go. Okay. But the you nice here. The it nice thing about everything. Gaffer's tape, it sticks to everything. It the glue lasts longer than and the it's glue. Black. The, well, you can get all different colors, but really, yeah. But then the the glue lasts longer than duct tape, and it doesn't get all like gummed up. Right, you, you can pe- pull it off. You pull it off, and it doesn't make a mess. Right, it's cool. expensive though. Yeah, it is expensive, but yeah. it does. But you look job. awesome. Yeah. So I don't know. I, it basically, there's two things you need to, like Patrick said, keep the moisture from other places from getting into the space. Like it's probably you know. Around the, you might even want to put um, weather, weather stripping, stripping on around the basement your basement door, door yeah. or just like we were talking about earlier, do a blower door. Or yeah, just but look. he's still running heat down there, so I mean, there's still going to be moisture in the air, especially yeah. he's at a gym. He's probably down there pumping iron. Yep. You know, he's splashing water yeah. on his head. Yeah, just breathing. Yeah, doing bucket sweating. challenges and things. Laundry's there too. Get the laundry. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Get but, Jeff uh, in. He's got a little rock climbing gym in the background. I mean, really, that basically you got to. Do as is much this, as you is can this a crisis? Moist. This is not a crisis. There's it, re- the thing is, this nothing's going to happen. Yeah. It can no. get wet. It can dry. Nothing. It's going to be yeah. a little the, gross. The only under risk there. is if it gets dirty in the water, and you're going to have mold under there. Right. right. This yeah. is this is kind of the kind of thing where we say that um, it gets wet, and the materials don't care. They can, it, it's like concrete. Concrete can get to, wet uh, all day. I wanted to confirm that. So he said this is epoxy uh, coating, and, and it might be, but there are acrylic coatings that look. Um, <laughs> They look very similar. In fact, I did uh, an article with a guy who used an acrylic coating instead of uh, this epoxy, right? Yep. There's some advantages. <clears throat> of w- using acrylic? Yeah. One of them is that at very th- thin thicknesses, it is somewhat vapor permeable. Mm-hmm. But the, the guy I talked to, uh, Tom Hall at Associated Concrete Coatings, told me that they are rare and it's unlikely that it is almost certainly water from the air not mm-hmm. coming through the concrete. But there's always that test you can do with that where you tape down a piece of polyethylene to the floor, and if it sweats underneath when it's after it's taped down, then the moisture is coming from below. So you heard it from Rob. But you got to tape, tape it so it's airtight, right? Yes. yes. Tape it so it's airtight so you know that none of that, that 
moisture is coming from the air in the room. And if the tape won't stick to the slab, then you know the slab's wet. <laughs> <laughs> Not really helpful, but... Or dirty and moldy. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Yeah. And I yeah. like the space. I think that's a cool space. Yeah, you know what? And it's going to be... It's really interesting for all of these systems like uh, dry core, you know, the little panels, the dimpled panels yeah, yeah. It, that a lot of people are using, and it's the same sort of situation there. It's, it's not helping, maybe. It's not, well, it's, <laughs> like, there's not as much harm of it getting wet because now you have a plastic subfloor, raised subfloor, and you have a slab, but it's also not solving the problem. Yeah. No. I think it's... And it's, it, like you said, any yeah. little material under there, like maybe the label... On those panels, if it's tacked to the underside and it's and it's made out of paper, it's yeah. gonna get moldy. That's mold but, food. I mean, that's the key. I mean, I've got a damp basement for half the year, and the way I deal with mold down there is just eliminate every material that's moldy. Like if things come in a plastic a cardboard box, I put them in a plastic bin and with a, with a lid on it, so that yep. you're not and keep stuff off the floor. Yeah, right. And it's a different <clears throat> system. I mean, people might say, well, what about all these dimpled membranes people put in basements, like continuous? That's the, that's the difference, though. Continuous. Rob Yeager did this, and under his basement floor, yeah, there is no connection between the potentially moldy cavern cavity. Between the slab and the, and the, house. And the floor, yeah. and it's not connected to your air supply or your house. It's so just, you tape the perimeter too. Yeah, yeah. it's totally yeah. sealed. Yeah, the key the key is not letting moist air into a space that is colder than the room you're in. So it's that which, was a it, very how are you going to stop moist air from getting in? No, there, but what I'm saying is like you're saying with that dimple mat under a slab or under a finished oh, floor yeah. that is air sealed at yes. the edges, and so it, in this situation, like like we said, it's it's maybe not as much of a concern if you're not actually seeing mold. Right. But if it if it's a problem, run the dehumidifier, seal the space from the rest of the house as best you can. Try to sweat less. Yeah. <laughs> do you, Patrick? Do you remember Diami's dad's house had this stuff all over the floor, and he was like at water level in the South Shore of Long Island, like fifty feet from Long Island from from the Great South Bay, and it was his had, wood shop, right? And he had a sump pump running in there. Like I don't know how he avoided <laughs> that being a total moldy mess. It was a it was a submarine practically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yep. I know you were excited to get an insulating question, Justin, so I got another one for you. Is that all we do around here anymore? Yeah. That's, uh, this is Jim from Haverhill, Mass. Hi, guys. My 19- I think it's Haverhill. How do you, does that say that, Rob? Haverhill? It does sound... Haverhill? Massachusetts has some Haverhill. of the most unpronounceable I like, names. Oh, yeah, like, I like Worcester. Like Worcester, yeah. What about Bill Ricca? <laughs> How do you spell that? Bill Erica. Oh, yeah. Those are all near Boston, right? Yeah. Gloucester, Gloucester. I'm All right, sorry, moving on. Boston. <laughs> <laughs> My 1923 Foursquare in Haverhill, Massachusetts is in need of some insulation, exclamation point. Under my floorboards <laughs> is about four inches of cellulose and live knob and tube, exclamation. Obviously, I have to fix this before I air seal and re-insulate. What's the best way to air seal a plaster ceiling? Anyone? Well, refer back to the first question we had. I mean... Yeah, it just... Yeah, you fill you any holes. Blower door directed air sealing. Um, and if you have holes, seal them up. Yeah, pay attention to electrical S- outlets. Fix your boxes and, and, are yeah. going to be a problem. Pipes are going to be a problem. And, are, and pull off your, well, not in, not in the ceiling, but on the walls, pull off the window trim because often you can you air know, seal around there's that. There's no seal there. Yeah. Uh, my chimney only vents my water heater. Is spray foam still a no go to air seal around it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. has to be metal two, flashing. Two, two inches of, of non-combustible space between any. You know. And right. some people have yeah. used rock sole. I, I did that. You're not, I don't think you're technically allowed to do it. I didn't think so either. But it was yeah. one of those like, well, I know that this is not nothing burn. can happen here. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, if you do metal flashing, I, I did a combination. You know, pack it with rock sole for the insulation value, and then seal it with metal and caulk for the air sealing. It's supposed to be uh, a special kind of uh, fireproof. Sealant, right? Uh, intumescent caulk. Yes, that's okay. what they call it. And that's made now, to... Intumescent, is that like it expands when yeah. it burns? It gets or a gets crusty yeah. char. Yeah. yeah. You're supposed to use that over foam paint. Uh, like if you do insulation exposed... Yeah, they have intumescent you paint. Intumescent paint. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some, some places you can do that. It's not always a fix. Yeah, some places you have to actually put a drywall. So the reason... Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, if your water heater is vented into a masonry chimney that once had a... Atmospheric combustion heating appliance, your furnace or boiler that was either gas or oil. Um, that's a risky situation. Uh, it's called an orphaned water heater. Ooh. Uh, and the problem is the, the flue in this 
instance, with only a relatively small gas appliance being vented into it, the flue is too big. Yeah. So the flue gases don't rise, and you can have spillage into the living space. So I would do an exhaust gas spillage test and make sure that that's not a problem. Spillage test. You can also, so what would be the solution if you found out there was spillage? You have to have the chimney relined, or you have to get a new direct vent. Relined meaning you can just have extend the chimney pipe up in through the yeah, flue. Yeah, they have they have <coughs> smaller vent. flexible vents that you snake yeah. down the but masonry chimney that ties to the. I'm sure this is what's happening connector. in my house because my well, I mean my furnace, my furnace goes up there, not the water heater, so it's less likely that it's a problem. But it's less likely because it's a much bigger burner. Right, right. You know, as you as you get. Um, newer appliances that are more efficient and have lower flue gas temperatures, you need a temper differential to cause a good graft, a draft in, in some cases. And so when I looked into doing that for my boiler on my old brick chimney, they recommend that you actually do the insulation around it, not just the pipe itself, because the pipe can cool off pr pretty quickly. Right. And so... so you don't insulate the, <laughs> the connector from the water heater to the flue. You, you, you put the liner down the masonry and then you pour this... It's vermiculite, a, vermiculite type, around yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, vermiculite. Lovely stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I bring that up. You didn't ask about that, but that's never stopped me from <laughs> pontificating <laughs> now, in the past. Is the spillage really a result of it's not getting out of the chimney fast enough, so it has more opportunity to find It doesn't gaps have enough cracks? buoyancy because it's just not enough heat. It's right. cooling off before yeah. it gets to the top of the chimney and falling but back But it's not down. a function of the chimney is, is not properly constructed like, it's, like there's leaks in it. It's just that it's too big, it's too big and it's hanging around. Yeah, and, and chances are pretty good that you don't have an airtight connection between your flue and your and your chimney. I mean, unless you're really oh yeah, careful. no way. You can uh, <clears throat> test this uh, the most rudimentary way by turning on your uh, ventilating fans, the range hood, the bath fans, uh, clothes dryer, and lighting a match, blowing it out, and see if the smoke goes up the draft hood on the on the on the water heater. So. Well, not if it's a gas dryer. Right. Why? Well, because aren't you trying to isolate it? You said it sounded like you wanted to turn everything on in the house and try and backdraft. Back draft. You're going to try and make as much negative pressure in the so house. So I was as saying that if your if your gas dryer is also hooked up there, it's not going to be helpful. Yeah, but it's vented to the outside, not in the flue. Oh, well, I, I, just in case it was. I mean, don't, don't some of them go up the flue? No, no. None? I don't have a gas dryer. <laughs> I didn't know if that was possible. I would tell you to be quiet then if you don't have a gas dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that I was a heat pump gas, heat pump electrical dryers yet. They do. They do. Yeah, so yeah I'm at the building show. But but from what I hear, oh, the ventless ones. Yeah, yeah from yeah. what I hear, that they take like ten times as yeah. long to well, dry your clothes. Well, I've heard two. I've heard two hours. So yeah. it's not ten times, but it's twice as long. Yeah. And you have to empty a. You have to have a condensate. Pump yeah, have to or empty a or something. Bucket of water and. You know, I think I did an article about these. I don't know why I just asked. Why don't we have them? <laughs> 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 Can't remember everything, people. Oh, uh, that's funny. <clears throat> Uh, we're still not done with Jim here. He's got more questions. The attic is unvented. It's a hip roof. Money is tight. Should I keep the roof as it is? Yep. Yes. Mm, yes. <laughs> how, yeah. How do you vent a hip roof? It's you don't. kind of impossible. A roof venting is like the biggest scam uh, <laughs> placed on the American people. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> what? <clears throat> It's well, one of the most elegant, simply working systems that there is. You get, I mean, you, if you vent it right, it, it does its job beautifully. If it's you really vent it hard. Right. And you need the right roof geometry for it to work. Low slope roofs don't work. Yeah. Hip roofs don't work. If you don't have Valleys the right, mess it up. And you got to have the right ratio of in, you know, intake to exhaust on the vents. Like your soffit vents have to be bigger than the ridge vent. But it's Jim, not that complicated. I mean, if you, do you know a, that, it, do you know that it's actually working? How yes. do you know? How do you know? I can tell. <laughs> I can feel it. I can. I, can, I don't have problems. <laughs> yeah. That's how I know. But you know, it's like. So that's the that's the thing. Is if you don't have problems. <clears throat> Don't worry about it. How many old houses have you seen that have been for, around for 150 years and they get a new roof put on and the roofer just automatically cuts a ridge vent in the end? Yes. Like it's and just the, like that's just part of what they yeah. do. We had this yeah. conversation with Don about his hip roof, remember? And his... Uh, I don't remember anything ever. His, uh, his roofing contractor, who seemed like a pretty smart guy, wanted to put these uh, soft... It's e-venting that goes on top of the roof. Right. And he's like... This seems like a bad idea. And I say, that's a bad idea. Well, I mean, it's a lot of people do it. I've seen it. Uh, why, why do you think it's a bad idea? Because of the possible snow? I think that snow and ice are going to back into that vent that's actually yeah. sticking up above the roof plane. Right. It seems like there's better ways. But th we have done articles on that. 
venting an old tricky roof mm -hmm. where it's built into the the drip edge. Um, I, that makes more I sense. I think you're going to hear from Mike Gurton. You're going to get an email after this <laughs> podcast, Patrick. I I, I I stand by my, what I said. <laughs> can, we, can we get Joe Stiebrick to chime in on this one, maybe? So or? Joe says it's a, a very forgiving <clears throat> roof assembly, right? And he yeah. changed his mind. Did yeah. He? yeah. He, he was, used to say he it was, was whole hog, like, vented is the way to go. And then suddenly it was like, if you vent your roof, you're an idiot. Hot roof's the way to go. And we're like, what happened? Did he... Is, is, what, uh, but what do we, we miss? <laughs> our hot roof is the way to go. Are we talking about a particular type of assembly or just across the board? I don't. I think it was. It felt. I. I, heard, I don't know how public it was. It in terms of like writing a paper about it. I just heard him talking about it at a booth at the show yeah. at a show one year. And I don't know. I'm not clear whether that was just to help sell those products. Yeah. Uh, it. You know. It, he it, does it, pay. Does yes. paid speaking things? I mean, I, I don't. I would think that he wouldn't alter the building science to, to make money. No, but He's and, and actually, kind of if you go on buildingscience.com and search for building assemblies that work in different climates, yes. they've got you, you can know, do it both ways. There's so many for different sure. assemblies, and they're and they're very regionally specific. I like so. a cold roof where the <clears> venting is on top of the roof deck. You like that, Patrick? You mean where you basically have a double layer roof? Yes. Yeah, and yeah. That, that that's especially it's pretty bomb valuable. Roof. It's especially valuable in places like the Rockies where you get yes. lots of snow. Or if you have sips. Or yeah. if you're in a cooling <laughs> climate, right? That's a good yeah. way to cool off. It's a great it's way to use extra layer of sheathing, too. That's so what I was going to say. That's, a, that's a pretty expensive way to make, like, a roof that performs the same as almost all the others. Well, the, the lower layer doesn't have to be, you know, it, it can be just like OSB or something. You know what or, I like is nail base, which is used on commercial roofs, which yes. has... Uh, Rigid insulation bonded to uh, typically OSB substrate, and like, you like the zip bar stuff. It gets a little complicated for roofs because you have to get an engineer's stamp to tell you how to fasten it. Really? I would think so. I mean, you're nailing through foam into a roof. I, I mean, that's the reason why zip system. You know, Huber hasn't come out with you know details for the roof for the roof because it's a sticky wicket, so to speak. Man, not that you can't do it, but just it's hard to have a universally useful solution. Plus, plus at the roof plane, you've got to have a higher higher R value than you would on the wall because of the, the stack effect. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I just tossed that out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, wait a minute. So it's a walk up attic. Should I just lay some two inch foam board over the opening? Yes. Yes. Sure. I did that. It worked. It worked really well because my house. Had did a you weight it down? Did you put yeah, something I, heavy on the top? Um, like a two by six. No, I just used a big full sheet of, of of rigid foam, and there was no railing at the attic floor around the whole opening, so I was able to just put a big sheet of foam. Who has a, a railing around their attic hatch? I've been in houses like that. Get out! Really? Yeah. I'm we're walk. talking about we're talking about old houses with finished with tongue and groove floor walk up attic. Oh, you're talking about an attic space, not yeah. like an attic. But he's got to walk no, he's up. He's not talking about a pull down ladder. Yeah. yeah, he's talking about a stairway. I'm talking about a lot of times if you've got an attic like that, you might have a knee wall at the top, or you might have a railing at the top of the stairs. Yeah. I think we just need to remind people <clears throat> that your attic could be conditioned or unconditioned, yeah. right? If it's conditioned, keep it conditioned. Yeah. If it's, it's unconditioned, keep it unconditioned. Yeah, right? I mean it, attics, especially in people like those that that craftsman house we were looking at earlier, where they've got a partial sloped roof. So many of those attics, and we've talked about this before, people, they don't decide whether the space is inside or outside the envelope. It's kind of like, That's oh, well, it's first, out of sight, out of mind. First thing to do. You know, it's yep. just like I've got a little closet behind a knee wall, and I've got a door that's leaky as heck going in there, and I store stuff in there, and then it's open right into the roof, you know, cavity. Right. And it's like you got to decide either seal off the knee wall or, or, seal, or the door. seal off the roof cavity. Yep. <clears throat> Words to live by, but yeah. So <laughs> laying laying rigid foam across across the opening to an attic, as long as it's reasonably tight fitting again around the seams, it's gonna. I want to get to this next question no. because yeah, it's, shut up, Rob. I, it's something that <laughs> okay. I I wanna I wanna talk about. Just kidding, Rob. We like you. Hi guys. I, care. I recently found the podcast and and I and I enjoy listening. I'm hoping to have a new home built soon, so I have some questions. I live at the southern edge of Climate Zone 5A, Mount Sterling, Illinois. We have bitter cold winters and hot, humid summers. As we say in Illinois, if you don't like the weather, stay another day. I'm going there. They're next so friendly. I'm going there next week. You should. How are you going to stay a few days? It, only if I don't like the weather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting on a quote to build the entire house with ICFs. We are in Tornado Alley. Yeah. The home will be 1,300 square feet. 
one story with a full basement. Regardless of whether I go all ICF or just for the basement, my question is, are as follows. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. I can't make heads or tails of water slash air slash vapor slash thermal barriers given my location. So what do you think he means by this? Let's, let's do these in a little <laughs> section here. You got them in the right order. Mm-hmm. No, wait. Yes, you have them in the right order. Order of, of priority. So you need all those things. Water, air, vapor, thermal. And you should be able to trace their path on an elevation of any yes. uh, architectural rendering, right? And oftentimes, several of those functions are collapsed down to a single They do one layer. thing. One thing does yep. all those things, or M- several. Many of them, yeah. Okay, so. Well, in the case of ICFs, it really does everything. I think it does all four. Yes. Yeah. ICFs are pretty sweet. Uh, I, I want to get to ICFs. I got I got some strong opinions. I, I'm sure you Me do. Too. <laughs> I, apparently, we're recommending not venting roofs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts are ICF basement with form a drain around the footer. Do you guys know what that is? Form a drain. It's a form and a, f- found a, a footing drain. In so one. it looks like a two by ten, except it's hollow plastic, and it it contains the concrete while it cures. And it allows water to, it acts as a, fo- a footing drain uh, in addition. It's a pretty cool product. It's on the side of the footing, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yes. You put it on both sides or just the inside? Both sides. Interesting. And they're, and they're connected uh, every so often with four inch or three inch pipes uh, intermediately. Very cool. So you yeah. just drop these things down on your leveled, compacted, undisturbed soil and then pour into them for your footings. Yeah. I've seen them more typically placed on a gravel layer, right? You, you, that way you. Sweet. Yeah. That's neat. We should do that as an article. I've never seen that. It's a cool thing. Anyway, uh, EPS foam under the slab, very good. Uh, butting up to the ICF. Yep. Poly wall or similar, that's a, that's a brand of ICF. Peel and stick with a dimple mat outside to, to relieve hydrostatic PSI. Peel and stick to what? I'm assuming he means on the ICF, right? And then, then the dimple mat. Okay. Uh, Couldn't you just use dimple mat? Rock wool bats in the walls, then drywall. Finally, pump the attic full of blown-in cellulose. Assuming my budget can afford all that, am I thinking correctly? Am I missing something? Is there a cheaper but just as effective way of achieving all of this? I, do, you right, that, do you need that peel and stick on the wall of the ICF? On the ICF? I think if you have that dimple membrane and it's detailed correctly, that you might be fine. But I don't know. I, I, That's what Gurton did in Rhode Island. Didn't he put peel and stick? Yeah. Yeah, he, you're right. He did it up the whole wall. I think that yeah. would make sense. I guess it would be kind of belt and suspenders, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea, my whole thing with ICFs is the idea of having EPS exposed to the outside, even just even just to minimize pest intrusion, right. you know, would be nice to have a, a continuous layer yeah. of something over it. I think ICFs make sense in, in the Florida Keys and in the Caribbean, but like... It's just too expensive. Like, I would want to spend the money on stuff that I could enjoy instead of concrete in my walls. Why do you like ICS, Justin? Well, it's just, a, it's a, like I said, it collapses all four of those control functions into one layer. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what's the R value of, like, a typical, I mean, I'm sure there's a range. You get different thickness versions. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the, the <clears throat> thing that the ICF manufacturers always claim is that it's thermal mass, which is sometimes good and sometimes it's not. Yeah. It's... I don't think it's a fair uh, R value. I, I'm not saying, you know, I want to build a whole house out of ICFs. I just say there's a lot of advantages to them, it's, uh, definitely for basements. Like, they're yeah. great for basements. A lot of people just stop there. And he's and suggesting he might do that, and yeah. I, I would say do that. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't – like you said, Patrick, in areas where you have severe weather, they, they start to make a lot more sense. His – his uh, he want, he's worried about – Tornadoes, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a great thing. But you can also make a wood frame house stand up much better to tornadoes. So I, I put uh, the story we did with Brian Redling a few years ago. Uh, it's a time he was an engineer with the APA. Mm-hmm. And um, he's a researcher on uh, making houses more hurricane and, yeah. and tornado resilient. And, um, and for most tornadoes, most of the tornadoes in this country are one or two on the – on the Fujima scale, right? Fujima? I think that's the guy's name. Really? I thought it was category. Category one and two? Uh, we have to look this up. Well, I'm no. going to have to look Keep this moving. up. Keep moving. Okay, forget <laughs> it. We'll, we'll put it in the notes. <laughs> anyway, most tornadoes are, are small and, and, and short-lasting, right? Yes. Uh, 
if you build a house the way Brian tells you to, yes. it's going to survive a, a one or two. Yeah. Threes and fours and fives are very rare. Uh, and if they hit you ha- your house, no matter what it is, there's going to be significant damage. Right. Because you're going to have breaches of the openings. Right. Or it's just going to be hit by debris. Even if you built the yes. best house, it's kind of like the idea of like, oh, I'm a great driver, but you got to worry about the other people on the road. Well, you totally got to worry right. about other people's houses hitting your house in a f- Category 5. Or what I would worry about is like houses like in Brian's story that are lacking foundation bolts and simply blow off the foundation. Right. Like that's that's what to worry and about. And even in ICF walls, you're going to have a wood frame roof, and if it depressurizes, the it's roof's going to roof roof off. go right off. And can you imagine repairing an ICF wall compared to a framed wall? I mean, I can't imagine. That's got to be a... Wait, am I saying that right? Does it depressurize or pressurize? What's the risk there? Uh, it pressurizes. So pressurize. you, you have a, you have yeah, a, door. That's a why breach, have... and then it fills the house with air, Correct. which has nowhere to go, and <clears throat> right. pushes off the which roof. Which is why outswing doors are often recommended in those areas, because they can't blow in and, and pressurize the house. And the old uh, adage that you should uh, like open a window during a tornado, don't do that. Don't do any old <laughs> adages. Don't, yeah. Don't, yeah. Stop. Don't People open. used to say, oh, you want to let the pressure out. Well, no, you don't. You don't you're letting it in, too. Yeah. Um, so I think his assembly is good. He's, but he's saying, is there a cheaper but just as effective way of achieving all of this? Wood frame house. Yeah. Fully sheathed, not with foam, but with plywood or yeah. OSB. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think uh, about the overhangs if you're and, in a really wind, high and wind I, area. And I would argue if you're if you're already thinking about ICFs, which are going to be, what, like a minimum of 8, 10 inches thick, then you could consider a double stud wall and really jam-pack that thing full of insulation. Yes. And it's going to be a benefit all year round instead of in tornado season. Right. Yeah, I mean, basements, and it's, I, I think like, ICFs make a lot of sense for basements, and they also make a lot of sense for small do- DIY projects, but the cost and the complexity of them is it, I mean, I, I guess you've, you've got the whole basement done and you're not breaking forms down, but but it just seems like going up multiple levels, it's like you've got to pour multiple times, don't you? Yeah, no, and yeah. who wants to, who wants to f- <clears throat> like, flash windows into a concrete wall and stuff? I just, like... <laughs> Well, you build those plywood bucks the same way you would with like other yeah. odd Thick odd wall. types of walls, and and so then you've got these weird connections. Yeah, I, I think I like double stud walls now. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's my favorite. You know, as if people are thinking about energy efficient building and they're used to traditional building methods, there aren't many methods that are simpler to transition to that better than a double stud wall. Right. You're not doing anything differently. It's almost like you're building little rooms. Yes. You, your same framing crew can yep. do exactly the same work. They're just building an, an additional interior wall is all right. they're doing. Right. I can tell you... Uh, Pay attention to load paths, so... And yeah. get a good dense pack cellulose insulation exactly. contractor because it takes a long time. And I'm sure it's very tempting for those insulators to kind of get fast and loose with how much cellulose you're putting in there because you can't tell the difference to look at it. Yeah, and and the thing is, it's like if you if you find a good contractor and, and you're in an... It, it, it can be just as ch- it can be just as affordable to pay them as it would be for you to buy the materials and and do any you know, alter- any other alternative insulation. Hey Patrick, yourself. do you know how sometimes they recommend in, um, you know, uh, like deep uh, open web truss roofs, or if you did double stud walls and you're gonna blow in cellulose, you put the vertical membrane dividers, so you kind of section off that yes. huge deep wall into sections. How do you deal with? Um, mechanicals and electrical and pipes running through horizontally when you have to put that membrane up? Do you put it up first and then drill holes, just poke through it? Well, the house that I saw where this was done, there wasn't any mechanicals there wasn't any. Any yeah. in the roof. Uh, my assumption would be you just put the, the fabric up and the, the pipes and ducts have to be in there before you insulate, right? Sure. So then you just have to cut the, the, the mesh around the penetrations. I wonder if then you have to go back and like seal all that stuff just to make sure it doesn't communicate with the next bay so when you're filling it, it can get a good... Well, so like it it, it can... It'll still build up to the right density if there's a, a bit of leakage right. because it, 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 it seals itself, it's right? sort of like a who, who gives who gives a crap. Just, just fill it up. Keep going, yeah. Yeah. It takes forever. The house that I saw, yeah, I was it was good. a room addition and it took days to insulate. You ordinarily, you know... An insulation crew is done in hours. Yeah. Yeah, I've been in a double stud insulation with cellulose, too, and it was slow. But what you notice when it's all done is the room is so quiet, yep. which is, means that there's no air movement, you know, because air is how sound travels. So yep. it's just yeah. you can tell it's doing a good job. Uh, another reason w- to get a good crew using the right materials is that drywall insulation 
installation over the membrane can be a, a Cause problem. Because it, it bellies out a little. <clears throat> yeah. 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 I've seen a lot of people use strapping on the walls horizontally to just kind of contain some of that. Yeah. So I will put a, an article uh, written by John Riley that appeared in Fine Home Building several years ago. He's an insulation contractor in uh, Maine, mm -hmm. and uh, he's probably the smartest uh, insulation guy I've ever met. So, but he he will explain all the intricacies of dense pack. Yes, you can also check out the uh, Passive House build with Steve Basic from years ago. And Steve Basic has a new blog on our website. He does. He's going to be talking about uh, long live our buildings, right, Rob? This is about durable construction? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. so... Uh, and he's the guy to write about it, too. He's a smart guy, too. So Justin mentioned uh, a couple of... It, Steve has um, written about a, a few passive house and other energy-efficient projects, and we even did have a couple of video s series on some of his projects. And the one thing, and this is when I worked for Green Building Advisor and and Fine Home Building, a lot of times we, we walk away at the end of the build when the keys are handed to the right. homeowner, and you don't really get the, the full story. What Steve's planning on doing is some of these houses, people have been living in them now for years, and he's going to revisit those houses and um, basically check in with the owners, check in, see how they're performing, and then really get into the details because you is don't he going to drill holes? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in a, in a magazine article or a video series, we only have so much time to go into the details. But if he's going to do a, a column on a regular basis and, and he, he can take, you know, five, six, ten uh, episodes or issues where he can really dig into the details. And so hopefully we'll get a better picture of how some of these houses are really working and why. Cool. I've been... Uh following a Facebook friend who's talking about who does dense pack cellulose and they've been doing um, seasonal well year-long monitoring so they can uh, monitor season to season to see if there's any moisture accumulation in these in these very deep cellulose cavities because that's been one of the concerns with that assembly mm -hmm. and there's no problems even in a you know challenging climate like Maine it seems to work really well yes do you guys have anything to add that's it. I don't know. You didn't go over any of your uh, projects at the beginning of this. Uh, this We're already over an hour. Yeah. Really? Can't take any more. Can't take any more. It seems like we've covered all the bases. <laughs> and I didn't really want to <laughs> talk about my clogged sewer. <laughs> 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 I got back from the Builder Show, and my wife said, um, Hey, uh, before I hand you the keys to the house, she was heading to Seattle uh, the following day uh, and, and, stay, and staying in Newark for an early flight. And she said, before I, you know, turn the keys of the house over to you and Liam, I uh, just wanted to let you know that the, well, the toilet isn't flushing. I was like, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we'll talk about that another time. But it's fixed. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, what do you say, Patrick? I think, uh, I think we're done here. I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank uh, my co-hosts and Jeff for being with us today. And uh, please remember to send us your questions and comment however you listen. Thanks for listening and happy building. Happy building.